Hello. Welcome to True Fire Live. This is Brad here in True Fire Studios. This is our second live broadcast from True Fire Studios. Uh, we did the first one about a week ago. Everyone shouted out, said they loved it. So we have a really, really uh, special treat for you today. You are looking at Ellis Paul. Ellis is someone we've been listening to for a very, very long time. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. I was a big Dylan fan back in the day, and uh, Ellis is my new Dylan. He is a wonderful storyteller, in, incredibly creative, I love his guitar playing, and uh, fortunately for we uh, guitar players and aspiring songwriters, he is a passionate educator. We're here doing uh, a couple of courses. Um, I'm gonna get Ellis to tell you a little bit about them, but I wanna read you a quote. Uh, this is from the New York Times. Despite his success and sense of history, Mr. Paul remains an artist with his eye on the future and an interest in discovering the transformative potential in his music. He's got 20 albums, actually 19 of them were released. One is just coming out. We got to hear Ellis several of the tunes the other night at the concert. Um, so with that, I uh, am thrilled to welcome Ellis to True Fire Live. Hey man. Thanks for having me, Brad. I've had a ball with you the oh, last couple of days. It's been, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, you're also having a look at the set we put together um, for Ellis's uh, two courses. It's a real departure for us. We've had a, a blast conceiving it and setting it up. Uh, good thing you can't see below the couch. <laughs> uh, um, there's sharks and alligators uh, and manatees. We're in Florida, so there's... <laughs> Exactly. I think that's so, Bing Crosby. <laughs> <laughs> Looks pretty good. What is he, 150 now? Yeah, so. well, you know, but he's <laughs> still looking okay, you know. Um, Ellis, tell us uh, briefly, because we'll dive deeper as, as we go today, sure. a little bit about both of the courses that you're shooting here that you brought in to do. Well, the main function of the first class is the birth of a song. We want to get people to generate uh, a first draft in as quick of a time as possible. For me, it's, it's you wanna hit it when the iron is hot. The first 72 hours is when your, your passion for a song is really at its highest and then it starts to cool after three or four days and it becomes harder to finish, harder to focus on, harder to find the passion to ignite to get it. So the, the first class is really establishing the importance of what a song is and then describing how to get there in 72 hours. The second class is how do you get it from that first draft to a final finished draft that you can perform on stage or bring into a studio and record and, and, uh, and then release to the public. It's like how do you graduate your song from being in your closet, in your writing space, in your, in your, in your creative space out into more of a public forum. So those the, are the um, two. Uh, we're about, well, we finished the first one. It was killer. Okay. <laughs> um, and I, I see a lot of the production staff here already grabbing their hook books and starting their own birth of a song. Um, we hear this question asked uh, a million times. Can anyone be a songwriter? Yeah, I would say, yeah. I mean, if anyone can write a story or express themselves in, in writing, then I would say, yeah. Um, and even if you can, if you can work with somebody that, that can help you get it to that point, you can. But I can't promise anyone that uh, you could learn how to be Paul McCartney or you could learn how to be, you know, Joni Mitchell. That, there's an innate talent to being profound uh, that... I don't know if that kind of thing is learnable. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't write great songs and, uh, and move people to tears, move people to laughter, move people to you know, a better place in their lives and maybe even nudge the whole planet in a direction that's positive. And uh, God knows we need more songs that do that. So yes, anyone can write a song. I can't promise you that you, you'd be a genius and you can find that kind of thing, but I think everyone's got a fingerprint personality, and um, if they can express themselves, I know for sure people have stories to tell, and uh, songwriting is just one way to do it. 
we uh, we were, I, I think, Folk Alliance was what last March was it? February, yeah. Okay, in February, and uh, it's it's where we finally connected with Ellis. We sat in one of his sessions, absolutely blown away, as you will be when you dig into these courses. Um, but what also blew us away was how many very, very talented, y y you know, young singer-songwriters there are making, writing, performing incredible uh, music. Is there, I is this a golden era for singer-songwriters? <laughs> is there like a burgeoning, you know, what's going on in this space? I think um, we're in an interesting time in, in in many ways, the golden era that you're talking about is sort of the opportunity. It's really broad. Like anybody who has a cell phone can record a version of them performing and then send it out on the internet where you have access to 7 billion people on the planet. Uh, you know, we're all, all of our creative personalities and, and almost any field has this access to the masses that we never had before, so we're all really generating um, a media company. Um, so that's fantastic. But who has the time <laughs> or, the, or the energy to do that? And then how do you get heard above the din of everyone else who's doing it? In the olden days, uh, which I would call the 90s and the, and the aughts, early aughts, we had this sort of label system where people were funneled into uh, a filtering thing that took all the flack out. So if you wanted to be a professional songwriter, you know, you had to be accepted into the system of a record label and a management company and a booking agency. And that had a way of keeping the din away. You know, only a selected bunch of people could be put through that little little tube. That, And if you got lucky enough to create a career out of it, you could. But now those systems, uh, they, don't, they don't function in the same way, and, and many of them don't function at all. And, and most people who are singer-songwriters are their own record label. They're their own management company. They're, you know, they're producing the records themselves at home because the technology now is good enough for the home studio. And so it's, uh, it's an embarrassment of riches, and it's also like trying to get a drink from a fire hose. You know, it's... There's just so much, and to be heard among that, you know, the din of it all is is, is hard. And uh, I don't know what the secret is. Great songs generally do great work for you. I know that. Um, I know when I have something special on my hands, and if a song sticks out in my catalog, it generally has a future that sticks out as well um, amongst my other songs. So it starts with great songs. Um, people are no longer buying songs. We're making micro pennies instead of pennies now <laughs> for songs. So it's a little bit harder financially to make a living doing it because um, that part of our income is, is out of the window. But, but again, you know, getting the power that is in the hands of the songwriters greater than it's ever been at the same time. So it's, uh, it's exciting and scary, and I don't know that anyone really knows how to navigate it well yet. Well, hopefully you're figuring it out as we go. <laughs> um, speaking of great songs, play one for us. Sure. Play, play one of the new ones. All and right. Give us a little background as well. Well, I was working with a guy named Jamie Kent on this one. Um, he's a young songwriter out of Nashville, Americana, and he has kind of a style that's like John Prine's. And uh, I wanted him to write more in a sly, smart-assy kind of way, like John Prine can do. And uh, so I was thinking it was Easter, and I was thinking of Jesus coming out of the tomb and looking at the world and saying, I can't deal with this, uh, these, this mess that people have created. And he turns around and goes back in the tomb. So the idea was like, if I was Jesus, I'd laid back down. That was the whole concept of the song. So I wrote out a quick couple verses for him. It was very smarmy, very funny, very sacrilegious, uh, but, but with intention, not putting Jesus down. But uh, if I was Jesus, I'd be like, nah, no moss, I'm going back. Um, and so I sent him it, and then he wrote me, uh, when, when we got together in Nashville, he had written this chorus that had just turned the song around on its head, and it took this bizarre but beautiful right-hand turn. And uh, I'll just play it for you and you'll hear it. I 
Ain't no Jesus Never saved a soul Never walked on water Except ice and snow There's a rumor in the choir I'm just the luckiest guy they know But I ain't no Jesus Never saved a soul Ain't no Buddha Oh, I struggle with wrong from right I ain't no prince of peace I've hit the floor and a good bar fight I'll ask forgiveness come Sunday Asking for trouble Saturday night I ain't no Buddha I struggle with wrong from right No, I can't walk can't part the sea. The only miracle I have seen is you walking down the aisle of me. No, I can't talk to God. I ain't divine. The only miracle I have seen is I can call. No carpenter, I'm more sailor than saint. I'll put a hammer on a thumbnail, swear so loud they close heaven's gates. But I built you a four post bed now, darling. Don't make me wait. I ain't no carpenter, I'm more sailor than saint. No, I can't walk. On water, can't part the sea. The only miracle I have seen is you walking down the aisle of me. No, I can't talk to God. I ain't divine. The only miracle I have seen is you let your heart. How do you preach to the masses when you can't even talk to the girl? You get a little courage from holy wine, but then your speech gets slurred. I ain't no savior. I ain't got the words. No, I can't walk on water. Can't part and see. The only miracle I you walking down the aisle to me. No, I can't talk to God. I ain't divine. The only miracle I've seen is you let your heart be mine. The only miracle that I've seen is you let your heart be mine. Oh my, you let your heart be mine. Oh my, can I clap on behalf <laughs> of the whole audience? It's nothing like the <laughs> nothing like the sound of one That's man clapping. Beautiful. I have to tell you that we have heard these songs now from the concert several times here. We're all walking around the halls humming these melodies. We're just really blown away, man. Oh, thank you. Um, some questions all from right. the audience. Oh, the audience. Wow, we have an yeah. audience. So uh, what is the one piece of advice that you can offer a songwriter who's trying to make a living at it? <laughs> 
One piece of advice. Oh, one piece of advice is community, I think. Creating a community of other songwriters where there's competition between you, um, a chance for learning opportunities, a chance for business opportunities shared between you, um, setting up gigs together, you sharing your contacts, you sharing their, their sharing your, their contacts with you. Um, I don't think if you're operating in a bubble, you can do it alone. So um, obviously great songs means great opportunity. With, with great power <laughs> comes great responsibility. With great songs, uh, you know, you work your way into venues, you work your way into opening slots. And, but, you know, the best thing to do is, is to create a community around you or, or to tap into a community that's already there. And if that means going to open mics or finding people online or, um, because that's where the, the juice happens, the energy happens, the camaraderie happens, the support network happens, the cheerleading happens. Um, and, and that's how it happened for me. I, I came out of, very, of a very vibrant singer-songwriter scene in Boston, and some of the best songwriters in, in the country are still doing it full-time. Um, people like Dar Williams and Patty Griffin and Jonathan Book from the story, Vance Gilbert, Martin Sexton. Uh, th these people are, st you know, national names, and they have been for the last 30 years, and we were all at the open mics together sitting right next to Daryl Scott and, and, uh, and all these other folks out of the Boston scene. So I think community is really an important aspect of success. Thank you, Alice. That was well stated. <laughs> um, more questions. And there's a question here that really ties into one of the things that we really wanted you to show. Mm -hmm. um, besides being an extraordinary uh, singer-songwriter. And dresser. Alice, I don't and, know if you know. And dresser. The, and the fastest. <laughs> Uh, he digs the vest, the colors. You should see the wardrobe he brings in. Um, with a traveling valet, I might add, <laughs> right? No, no valet. Um, the, uh, Ellis is also an awesome illustrator. And uh, we had, we first saw the posters, you know, the editing wheel poster. Mm -hmm. And the first course, Birth of a Song, that we're doing here has a brand new poster. I, if you could answer this question and then show us those posters. Sure. Okay? Uh, the question is, is there a best way to write a song? That's a good setup is for the posters, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, let me show you. Do you mind if I step off camera here for a no, second? No, go ahead. I, I fear that I might un unplug something here. I'm free. He's I am free. free. All right. I think I have everything I need here. So we've found these posters to be uh, not only, you know, very visually uh, interesting, but yeah. incredibly, uh, they, they just give you this incredible guidance. And I, and I think they're part of the answer I hope you'll give to this question, okay? Well, I think, you know, overall, uh, the best way to write a song is just to be completely honest and, and try and represent truth in some way that shows love, sincerity, and well-meaning intent. I think if that's your, your foundation, Roy Acuff, I believe, had this quote of, you know, all you need for a great song is three chords and the truth, and I, I think there's a lot of truth in that statement um, because you can't, you know, if your heart's in it, then the pitch is going to be true. And like any piece of art, there's going to be wobbles in the pitch. And these, and these, um, these posters, this is a song-generating poster, and, and it just talks about sources of ideas and where they come from. And when you're stuck, this is a great poster to generate ideas. Uh, and it spins around and, you know, it, it talks about the people that are in your life or people in history to write about, writing about what you know. And I would also say part of that is writing about what you love and care about. It's, it's being able to wrap your head around an idea and then be invested emotionally to it in such a way that it translates in the song and then people hearing the song actually feel like they know the subject and they know the heart of it. And, and that's what creates 
movement and tears and, you know, goosebumps and all those beautiful things that songs can do. Also, other art, books, arts, movies, newspapers are great sources for songs and stories. Your biography and random things like a snippet of conversation that you hear at a restaurant or cracking open a Chinese fortune cookie and pulling out an idea from that. And then this poster is a companion poster to it. It's a teaching tool called The Incredible Editing Wheel. And once you get that first draft done and you have that wobbly idea of a three-minute song that's based on truth in your heart and your, your biography and your story, there's a way to refine it. And this is a, a learning tool that does it. Um, I, I s explain what verses are, how they're basically the nuts and bolts information in a song, how they're, it's conversational. It needs to f you need to believe in the narrator, so believability is a wedge. The narrator and the audience is a wedge. The orchestration of the song and how it plays into the mission statement. Like the mission statement is basically what is the song, the who, the what, the where. How do you want that song to work in the world? And um, how do you want it to work for you in the world? And then, you know, using the senses to write visual imagery and, uh, and then we look at melody and choruses and bridges and, and there are little snippets on all of these so that it's not to be consumed in one glance. You're supposed to just see one little thing and it's supposed to inform your day. And if you get stuck, you just come over to it, take a look at what you're stuck, what section you're stuck on and hopefully find inspiration. So I, t I do so many workshops that I found myself drawing these circles Every time I was going to a workshop and I finally said, you know what, I'm just going to make a definitive version of those learning tools and, uh, and then use them as handouts and I've been selling them at shows and they, uh, they're good lessons in, in creative life. So um, they've, they've been selling pretty well even to non-songwriters. They are they're killer and in fact, um, both those posters are inspirations for the two courses we're shooting here. They're Mm -hmm. essentially the s skeleton sibilist for both yeah. of the courses, right? Yeah, it's like a template almost. Um, do, do us a favor. Take yeah. Answer this question using the poster. Okay. Um, top three ways, or three ways, to bust out of a rut. You know, you've got writer's block, you want to write a song, you can't. How, how could you use that poster and or the course we're shooting to bust out of a rut? Well, I would use the song generator for that kind of rut because it sounds like you might have writer's block somehow. So you go to a poster like this and, and there's some suggestions on subject matter, f but there's also suggestions on like creating a space in your home that inspires you to be a writer. Well, oftentimes you're sitting in front of a crappy coffee table and the TV's there and there's, there's traffic in the kitchen, people run into their refrigerator, the phone's constantly ringing, there's noise from other rooms. Creating a space where you can think and be a creative person because we know how little time you have in your day. If you could just create that space for yourself, that for one will help. I bring my cell phone or a journal everywhere I go and when I snatch an idea, I write it down in my phone immediately so I don't lose it. So I have thousands of ideas on my cell phone uh, over the years that I've kept. And if I come up with a little guitar thing, I record it in a voicemail. But I would come here and I would say, uh, let's look, maybe you want to write about a person. And I would say, why don't you just pick your favorite person to write about? And, and then we go to the wheel and there's some, some hints here. Who is the historical figure you might love? Somebody that's important to you, that you see a piece of you in, that either they're created by helping society as a whole or, or that you see part of yourself in them. What made them unique? What is their backstory that brought them to prominence? What joy, what scars do they have? What were the obstacles that were thrown in their path? What is their backstory? Write it. What are the objects and the things in their life that um, define who they are? You know, for Charlie Chaplin, it was a bolo hat. For Abraham Lincoln, it was a top hat. It was a beard. Like, how do these things play into that person's life? Um, or you use your instrument as a springboard. There's, there's so many different ideas on this poster. 
um, that it'll help you uh, break out. And the class itself is even more so because there are exercises that go beyond the poster um, that will help generate ideas for you as a songwriter. Thank you, Alice. Um, time for another tune. All and right. a musical uh, way of describing how a poster can kind of spark or, or you know, the content on the poster can spark creativity. Charlottesville. Sure. Tell that story All and right. the song that grew out of it. I live in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. And uh, I'm going to have to get the lyrics out for this, I think. Um, this it's, is a new one as well, right? Well, the, 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 the most recent draft is so new that uh, I wrote it a year ago, but the fir that was the first draft. And Show everyone your journal while you can. Yeah, this is, one, this is sort of my working man's journal. It, it has a lot of my, uh, my life in it and all of the songs being scratched and worked away and worked away and worked away. All these are album ideas and financial business stuff and then there's songs after song after song after song after song after song so I'm from Charlottesville Virginia and uh, obviously y'all probably have heard about the big event that happened there about a year ago we just hit the the anniversary of that event this this weekend and um, I wanted to write a song about it and this is the song what is the tuning? It's standard tuning, believe it or not. Which you told us only maybe 20% of your material is, is yeah. standard tuning. And we have a question about open tunings we'll get to later. But. Okay. I wanted it to be in standard because I wanted the song to feel... Um, Robert E. Lee is a central character in this song, and the Civil War is... Um, the white supremacists came to Charlottesville because the town was going to be taking the statue down. And so I wanted the vibe of the song to feel like it had that really old kind of Civil War kind of tune to it. So standard tuning seemed to be the way to get there. I love how dirty the guitar part is. Feels like somebody riding a horse, doesn't it? That's how the music represents the first scene here. General Robert E. Lee is sitting on a stallion right in front of me. The town says they're gonna take the old statue down. So white supremacists come snaking through the streets like something out of Genesis. I can't believe my eyes, neither side's gonna back down. When the war you're fighting for is born out of something disgraceful, you ain't fighting honor. So the choruses tend to be a little bit more emotional, a little more philosophical, whereas the verses tell the nuts and bolts of the story and provide all the information. Friday night out on parade with the citronella tiki torches. People left their porches to block the way. Screams and shouts and fights broke out. The cameras caught your face before your torch blew out. You should have worn a hood. You're up to no good. Tomorrow's judgment day. When the war you're fighting for is born out of something disgraceful. You ain't fighting honor. Saturday protest was canceled. A helicopter crashed, it was too hard to handle. A two cops down, fights breaking out across town. A life blown out like a candle. A president who loves a scandal. 
wouldn't take a side when a man in a car hit a crowd and mowed Heather higher down. When the war you're fighting for is born out of something disgraceful, you ain't fighting honorably, generally. So this kind of a bridge right here, it's like a fresh way to look at the song. For 150 years, we've come so far, but you haven't moved an inch. We will not flinch. There's no one here to land. When the war you're fighting for is born out of something disgraceful, you ain't fighting honor. Now the dismount. Awesome. Uh, I, in the course, in one of the more detailed sections as you drill deep on, on you know, the content in the wheel, you talked about um, for this song in particular, you were a journalist taking on the role of a journalist. Talk to that a little bit, please. Well, the first draft of this song um, was only two days after the event happened. So in the context of the event, almost everyone in the country knew what was happening. So I, I wasn't explaining in the first verse that the town wanted to take the statues down. And that was what spurred the, the protest by the white supremacists to come into town. And when I wrote the mission statement after the first draft, after I had already played it on the internet and you know, the two days after the, the event happened, I, I realized that the song wasn't going to hold up over time as we got farther and farther away from the event. Like, I needed to explain the motivation of what was happening and why it happened. And, and so, you know, I wanted to be a witness to that moment, and I put, I put Robert E. Lee uh, on a stallion because that had more drama instead of being a stone horse. He turned into a stallion, and then I described the town wanting to take that statue down. Um, and then the white supremacist snaking through the streets like something out of Genesis. I mean, that, to me, that was using alliteration and consonants on the S sound, so you could actually hear the snake coming into town, snaking through the streets like something out of Genesis. There's just this repetition of the S sound, which not only visualizes it, but you can almost hear what a snake sounds like as it slithers through the streets. And, um, and that was the main thing, is like telling the, tor uh, telling the story. I mean, the first draft of this song, I felt like uh, I let Stephen Colbert <laughs> come into my mind, and I was mocking the, uh, the, the white supremacists by saying, you know, they're carrying tiki torches and they're keeping mosquitoes and potential brides away. You know, saying th stuff like that that was funny and snarky, but uh, it just it was a distraction to the mission statement, which really was me trying to capture the state of the world right now that we're in, that this could actually still be happening and that these people would be stupid enough to come out in public and say, here I am, um, and this is what I believe, when you know that it's... Uh, it's dated, it's wrong, it's uh, immoral, it's a disgrace. So, you know, my, uh, my whole thing was like, tell the story of what happened, um, be a journalist here, not uh, a comedian, and, um, and let it rip, you know, put your opinion in there and, and have your fingerprint of how I feel about it somewhere in the artwork. Thank you, man. Um, we have, as you know, a lot of guitarists yeah. uh, that are students at True Fire. And as I mentioned, many of them are aspiring songwriters. And of course, that's why we're here together producing you know, content for them. So let's focus on that type of individual. Been playing guitar for 20, sure. 30 years. Um, you know, so uh, the, everything that they do is very guitaristic, right? <laughs> so we have some questions. Yeah. Um, do you start with the lyrics or the music first? So might 
in your experience, uh, someone who's a guitarist and maybe hasn't written before, to start writing the music first and then the lyrics? Or what advice would you give that type of aspiring songwriter? Well, a songs, you, you know, if you picture your, your artistic life as being a home with a thousand doors, those are the avenues that the songs can invite themselves into your life from. One of those doors is the guitar itself or the, the piano or wherever you write from. You write a piece of music that generates such a mood um, that it feels like it would be great for verses. So I'll, I'll show you a guitar-based uh, song. But before I do, I should just mention that uh, the, Ro the Robert E. Lee song, which is called uh, The Battle for Charlottesville, was generated from an idea, uh, a news event. A headline from a newspaper really that's where it started and then I thought what kind of music fits with what I want to say and I thought about what I wanted to say before I started constructing guitar parts so I wanted that guitar part to feel like someone was riding a pony it had to have that kind of sort of gallop thing going on and it had to feel like it could have come out of the 1800s that's where that guitar part came from this guitar part was something I fell into it's an open D. I just love that way this sounds. It's just hammer-ons. So to me, it felt a little Celtic-y. Like, so I just started humming a melody over it. for sure this might be it might already be a song it just came out of me so quickly the way I construct the melody but it sounded grave like something uh, something serious the guitar was saying this is a serious song the melody was saying this is almost feels like it should be played out of wake ended up attaching this idea I had. I had a conversation with my five-year-old daughter about um, life and death after my father passed away. She wanted to know what happened to her grandfather after he dies. Like, where does he go? And so there I had my funeral kind of wake kind of moment to see if I could take, grab that story and attach it to this very dirgy but beautiful um, Irish kind of wake thing and I combined those two ideas together and got a song out of it. So in that way the song um, was generated by separate ideas coming together at the same time. Sometimes the guitar itself will tell you what the song is about. Um, sometimes you have the title and uh, I have a song called The Storyteller Suitcase which is about the life of a singer-songwriter and uh, I had the idea for it. I wanted it to be a traveling song, almost autobiographical about my entire career and what life has been like on the road. And this is the guitar part that accompanies it that I came up afterwards. Let me see if I can find the right capo position before I talk out of my, my ears here. Also an open D? It's an open D, yeah. I'll sing you the first verse and chorus here. I packed my story teller's suitcase with a whiskey bottle and notebook and my songs. I met bar stool damsels, tomcats working a midnight scandal. Take me home, brother, trouble will be coming along. If you're gonna ride this gypsy's boxcar town to town singing rhymes Just when you think you're gonna lose yourself You'll see your name up on neon sign Oh, stories never let you down
So that kind of fit the exuberance, the choruses. That to me is the emotional lift and the upside of celebration that comes with being a songwriter. And the rest is kind of moody and, and very singer songwritery. I love the guitar part, the, especially the first bar. <laughs> Just that. You know, and I, I told myself when I record this, I'm not going to let a drummer get in the way of any of those things. Because just one little cymbal hit on a recording could just completely mask that. So you'd miss it. And uh, so this is going to be the first record that I produce myself, and it's going to be guitar-driven. The whole record is going to have every minor nuance that I normally uh, would get disrespected by the band, uh, who are always great players, but the more you layer, the more distant you get from the guitar. So uh, this next record is going to definitely show all of those things that I've been doing for years that nobody has heard on recordings. All right, so we have a confession to make. Uh-oh. Yeah. So Innocence and the Afterlife, which you showed us a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, we didn't really need a second and a third take of that for the chorus. We just love that song. So guess what? We want you to rewind and play that whole oh, thing. Oh, all right, us, okay? sure. <laughs> all right. I think I know who asked for that one. <laughs> so this is the song that I wrote uh, about my daughter and my, my father's passing. It's the Irish Wake guitar part and melody. This is my true life story Of karma and coincidence Of the afterlife and innocence Of a child and my father's ghost My father slipped into The sweet forever after Surrounded by tears and laughter, he stepped into the great unknown, into the afterlife. Oh, the mysterious afterlife. Now on that long train ride home, I was an orphan in the twilight Praying that by daylight I might speak to my father's ghost But no one came who shared my name Till my daughter with her five-year-old eyes She said, where did Papa go when he died? I said, honey, some people believe that when you die, you go to heaven. And there are angels there are waiting. There'll be family with open arms. Still others believe that we are nothing more than stardust. We are coincidence. And to stardust we return But then the Buddhists believe You can build a life of good karma And the afterlife won't harm you You'll come back as a living thing Like a bird that sings Flying into the afterlife So my daughter says to me Well then, could I come back as a puppy? I said yes If what the Buddhists say is true 
But then her voice changed and the tears came. She said, if I came back as a puppy, would I belong to you? getting better every time you play it too. It's, it's 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 so hard to get through without choking up really yeah, i'm sure um, it does um okay we are winding uh, down on time but we still right. have some questions so sure. i'm gonna fire them out at you yeah favorite open tunings um uh, i would say open d and then open g with the bass down to c so that tuning is a, a popular Joni mitchell tuning and it's c g d g B E, low to high, and I'm not in it right now. I'm in open D uh, right now, but you just get a, a beautiful amount of colors. An open D is D A D F sharp A D, um, low to high. And what's great about that is obviously it's D A D F sharp A D. So there's there's two A's and three D's and an F sharp. It's like my high school report card. There's Jim and Art. If you're curious. But what you can do there is you can ride the octave strings. And create melodies off of those. And, and then the forms are so easy. It's just, it's almost like an E7 form in open D. You bring it up, that's the first position. Second position, you're sliding it. You stack it on the fifth fret, you stack it on the seventh, and you return to it on the ninth and the, up to the eleventh, and then you stack it on the twelfth. And I just see these chords and patterns. I don't, I'd have to think and, and pull out an abacus to tell you what they were, but that's also in my ability, but not in my time right now. Um, but I just, I just love the open ringing of it, and I'm not a dad gad person because I feel like dad gad just it sticks the entire country of Ireland on every note that you play, <laughs> and you can't escape the Celticness of it. But with uh, with just moving that G down to open uh, to the F sharp in open D, you really it just sounds like a really rich kind of major chord open tuning and uh, I get a lot of flavor out of it and sometime we've been talking with the True Fire folks here Brad and Tommy about maybe doing a, an open tuning lesson and, a, and maybe a song orchestration you know how do you make guitar arrangements as a songwriter th that really are effective so a lot of classes is going to be coming up soon and I'm, I'm thrilled with my new relationship with these guys they're, they're a fun bunch to work with thank you man and uh, for everyone listening, either to the live broadcast or the on-demand version that will follow immediately, please give us some feedback. Tell us what types of courses, what topics you'd like to see Ellis cover. Um, we have a very long list, and we're going to have a very long relationship together, I'm sure of that. Um, next question. Where do you get your journals from? <laughs> I, I actually want to know that too. Come to think of it. Well, you know, um, I'm always snooping around. There's there's cheap journals. Um, if I may, just step off camera because this is an important thing. I'll you be, are. I'll, I'll be right back. Check out that beautiful set we put together. As long as you can't see below the couch. <laughs> so I have my scratch journals, which you know end up being hardcover books like this that I. I, I date on the spine, so when I'm looking at a shelf of 150 journals, I can see what year and, and pull it out, knowing that roughly like what album came out around then, what songs were I work, was I working on. And then I can dive in for free writing exercises. And, and they tend to be just really chaotic. I do a lot of my, my this is like a dream wheel of my, my business and, and how my business breaks down. I keep those kind of ideas and budgets in here and, and then work on the songs and scratch them out. 
But my final journals tend to be really nice pieces of art. This is a, a journal that was around $50 that someone bought for me as a gift in Washington. And um, it's leather bound and I needed a great journal. Sometimes the journal inspires how thoughtful you are with the stuff that you're putting in it because you've spent money on it and it just looks nice. So as you can tell, you know, it becomes sort of more of a personal piece of art and um, I've got paintings in here and I bring a watercolor set on the road and I paint as I, I go. And so this has the final versions of the songs it has diary entries. This is the Storyteller Suitcase, which I just played for you in the final written version of that song. And then, you know, just random kind of artwork here, sketches and things as I'm sitting on an airplane trying to kill time. And It's got like a Da Vinci vibe to it. If, if you've ever seen the sketchbooks of Leonardo da Vinci, a lot of drawings, little notations. Yeah, and there's... Uh, Are you, know, you related by any chance? <laughs> No, I wish I was. I'm not, I'm not a genius by any means, but I love, I love the craft of songwriting, and I love the, the craft of journaling. I love the craft of guitar playing. And these are all tactile things. You know, I'm using my hands, and I'm, I'm using my, you know, this, I'm using the same skills I had when I was so in love with art when I was five and six and working with crayons lying in the middle of my living room and trying to get my mother to put something up on a refrigerator. You know, it's... It's just the adult version of doing all that look at me, look at me stuff that uh, for whatever reason I'm just wired to do. Next question. What is the longest time it took you to write a song? And there's a PS that I love. I love the watch and wardrobe. Right. Really? Somebody yeah. said that. Somebody love the watch and, and wardrobe, which is actually very cool because you told me a story about at, uh, at the concert why you wore the clothes you wore, why yeah. you wore that particular watch, why you wore the shoes. Yeah. So you have to answer both those questions <laughs> in, in two in minutes or <laughs> Longest time it took you to write a song and talk about the wardrobe watch thing. I've had songs that have stretched out uh, two or three years um, and just been hovering in the background of my journals in the back of my mind and knowing that I had to make some leap in them that my skill level or my thought process hadn't created a, a, a bridge to. So, but I knew, but knowing that those ideas are great at the same time means you don't let go of the idea. You keep it there. Like, right, I, I told you last night, uh, there's this great idea that I've had that I haven't quite figured out how to capture. And it's about how, and now I'm going to give it to you guys and someone's going to write it before I get to it. But uh, it's about how a rancher kills wolves on his property, which creates an elk herd that becomes too big. Part of them die. They, they devour all the vegetation, so a beaver can't make a beaver dam, which was how the, the spawning of the salmon were, was happening in the river, and, and then how the ecosystem was just completely upended and turned around um, by the fact that this rancher decided to eliminate wolves from, from his property. And, and how that, and how do I get that in the song? And then, you know, I just read over the weekend that when wolves were put back into Yellowstone, it actually affected the ecosystem to the point of changing the direction of rivers because those, those beavers were, dammings were, were done. And what was the second question? <laughs> Talk about why you dress. Oh, why I dress the way I do. Well, I want to feel really confident in my skin that the person I'm presenting to my audience is the right person to, to sell these songs, this particular batch of songs. So I look at what they're about. They're about storytelling. They're about history, the current history and also our past. Um, they're about sensitivity and, li and literariness, like there's a writerly thing going on. And then I, I ask myself, you know, what are the tones and colors of those things in how I dress and present myself? So, you know, the vest gives me something of a, a literary professorial kind of vibe. And it also feels dated and it feels more like from the 1930s and 40s. This leather watch was designed actually from that era, although it's a contemporary watch. The design harkens to the 1920s and 30s. The leather strap here and my leather shoes 
and uh, I'm not in the entire get up here. All of those things to me, um, the leather guitar strap, uh, to me their representation is this. They remind me of leather bound books. And um, all of those things that I'm wearing are reinforcing the image that I want for the, for the stage persona that I want to sell the songs that I've written. So I'm trying to lock into my stage persona a visual representation of the songs so that I'm more confident when I deliver them and the impact that I present visually is more locked in as well so that they fly straighter. People sort of understand the vibe even just by looking at me. They kind of understand where the songs are coming from. And, uh, and that's a performance class. That's part of a performance class that I'll be designing too here for Wh Which we've talked about doing. And I, I, I will tell you, those of us that went to your concert, first of all, the place was packed, uh, standing room only. And, you know, truly, I'm not just saying that because you're here, but it was <laughs> a magnificent, extremely entertaining, visually interesting uh, performance. Not just the music, you know, but the whole, the whole, your whole thing up there, you know, with the record players, the way you dress. So this man definitely knows what he's talking about. And there's a rhyme and reason, pun intended, <laughs> uh, for everything that he does. And, you know, we're, we're very much looking forward to capturing all this kind of thoughtware and insight. And Ellis is very excited about sharing that with, you know, I general am. population. A couple more quick questions and sure. I'll have you play us out, okay? Um, this is a yes or no answer. All right. Do you have to be in Nashville or L.A. to be successful? Yes or no? Well, it depends on your, what your definition of success is. And, uh, you know, I've been able to do 5,000 shows uh, and have songs in huge movies, not little independent projects, but... Uh, you know, Jim Carrey movies and uh, Gwyneth Paltrow movies and Jack Black movies. I've been able to co-write with Grammy winners and have songs on their records. And I've done it all from Maine and Charlottesville, Virginia and Boston, Massachusetts. So um, that would be a no. That would be a that would be a no. I mean, right. if you want to be a commercially successful country writer, uh, your best option for success is to move to Nashville and to do that. But then there's Laura McKenna who's been sitting at home in the suburbs of Massachusetts with five kids out of her kitchen. She's the hottest writer in the last five years in Nashville. She doesn't even live there. And she writes with people on Skype um, and has produced, you know, Grammy winning country songs of the year like two or three times now. So it, um, there's a million ways to do this. I, I want to be a working songwriter and folk singer, and um, I'm not worried about, you know, commercial sense in the, I in the way that somebody like Springsteen is, or even one of these hit country writers are. I'm, I'm trying to create an artist career, and then do things on the side that I care about, like teaching with True Fire, and creating retreats, and travel excursions for fans, and things like that. Awesome. Our last question, and as you're answering, you're gonna pick up the guitar, and Play straight to the moon out. Okay. okay. Um, were there any individuals in your life that gave you insight in how to write uniquely, idiosyncratically? Well, I think there's so many examples of people that write um, with what I would call you. You call it idi idiosyncrasy or whatever the. Syncratically, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I think you invented that <laughs> I word. I was worried about being able to get that I, out. I, th myself. I think I think you know what you're talking about, though. And <laughs> what I say is that fingerprint thing, that fingerprint that shows up in Joni Mitchell's music to the point where <laughs> you could just read the lyrics on a page and you know it's a Joni Mitchell song. You know that's. That is something. And, you know, it's not like Dylan and the Rolling Stones didn't have this conversation because I know they did. Dylan would off, was sitting with the Rolling Stones, and I read this in some interview, where they were talking about, well, you know, could you have written, like, Jumpin' Jack Flash? And Dylan said, yeah, but could you have written Masters of War? And no. <laughs> you know, there's... And I'm not saying that the... Uh, 
the Rolling Stones are generic in any way because their flavor happens. It just maybe not so much in, in, in certain songs. But with Dylan, you know, once upon a time you threw the bums a dime in your prime, you know. I mean, that's, that's straight out of the brain, brain, brain mass of that guy and, and no one else could have written it. So there, there are examples of people like that who are superstars. And um, I would put Dylan and Joni Mitchell, John Prine, uh, Neil Young, uh, Springsteen, for a great deal of his work is. Um, and he can also write a straight-ahead pop song that's spectacular that could be written by almost anybody. You know, it's, it's, it's not so non-generic that uh, it's, it's not unique to him. But then, you know, he'll write Thunder Road at the same time. So, you know, or Nebraska or something like that. But um, Bill Morrissey was my, my biggest mentor. Bill passed away uh, about a decade ago, and uh, he was incredibly great with fingerprint writing. Um, he wrote like nobody else. And he produced my first record and gave me a lot of insights. And it was like working alongside Van Gogh. It was like having Van Gogh in your neighborhood, and you could go over and talk to this tortured soul who had been thinking about songwriting since the day they were born. And, uh, he was spectacular and very important to me. Play us out, if you would, and thank. Uh, sure. Thanks to everyone out there that tuned in. I know it's in the middle of the day. Uh, most of these True Fire Live sessions uh, from the studio, anyway, will happen around the same time. But fortunately, uh, they're all recorded. They're all available on our YouTube channel on demand anytime 24 7 and we'll keep them up there forever and uh, this is one ellis that we will cherish thank you very very much thank you brother you dance you swing them hips in pajama pants my boom boom skips i got no chance i've hopelessly fallen for you you're a moon Shot from Cape Canaveral, you're a cosmonaut Dressed in flannel, I got lift off You send me straight to the moon I walk this lonely world Recklessly searching for you Maybe you did too You stepped into my life and it's crazy how I love waking up to you Now my wandering days are through You're a skylark You sing like a dream You're a monarch A butterfly and a queen And it's crazy You send me straight to the moon Kiss and a wink, I'm a dirty martini, could pour you a drink. You are rocket fuel, you send me straight to the moon. I walk through lonely days, recklessly searching the world for you. Maybe you did too. You stepped into my life and it's crazy. Flip me like a pinball machine. You peg me like a ripe tangerine. You spud nick me. You send me straight to the moon. And I love you all the way to the moon. All right, are we off?